How Ben Franklin Stole the Lightning by Rosalind Shanzer It's true! The great Benjamin Franklin really did steal lightning right out of the sky. And then he set out to tame the beast. It goes to figure, though, because he was a man who could do just about anything. Why, Ben Franklin could swim faster, argue better, and write funnier stories than practically anyone in colonial America. He was a musician, a printer, a cartoonist, and a world traveler. What's more, he was a newspaper owner, a shopkeeper, a soldier, and a politician. He even helped to write the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. Ben was always coming up with new-fangled ways to help folks out, too. He was the guy who started the first lending library in America. His post office was the first to deliver mail straight to people's houses. He also wrote almanacs that gave hilarious advice about life and told people when to plant crops, whether there might be an eclipse, and when the tides would be high or low. And he helped to start a hospital, a free academy, a fire department. In colonial days, fire could break out at any time, and it was lightning that caused some of the worst fires. Many people believed that being struck by lightning was a punishment from God. Whenever thunderstorms were brewing, they would ring the church bells for all they were worth, but it didn't do anybody a lick of good. Of course, after Ben stole the lightning, there weren't nearly as many fires for firefighters to put out. Now why was that, I hear you ask? And how did he steal any lightning in the first place? Well, it's a long story. But before we get to the answer, here's a hint. One of the things Benjamin Franklin liked to do best was to make inventions. Why, Ben Franklin was a born inventor. He loved to swim fast, but he wanted to go even faster. So one day when he was a mere lad of 11, he got some wood and invented swim paddles for his hands and swim fins for his feet. Ben could go faster all right, but the wood was pretty heavy and his wrists got plumb worn out. That's why his second invention was a better way to go fast. He lay on his back, held onto a kite string, and let his kite pull him lickety-split across a big pond. You might want to remember later on that Ben always did like kites. Ben kept right on inventing better ways to do things for the rest of his life. Take books, for example. Ben read so many books that some of them sat on shelves way up high near the ceiling. So he invented the library chair. If he pulled up the seat, out popped some stairs to help him reach any books on high shelves. And in case climbing stairs made him dizzy, he invented a long wooden arm that could grab his books too. He also invented an odometer that told how far he had ridden to deliver the mail. And the first clock with a second hand. And he even thought up daylight savings time. Then he invented bifocals so older folks could see up close and far away without changing glasses. Everybody and his brother and sister just had to find better ways to heat their houses in wintertime. So Ben came up with a Franklin stove that could warm up cold rooms faster and use a lot less wood than old-fashioned stoves and fireplaces. People all over Europe and America loved Ben's glass harmonica. This instrument could spin wet glass bowls to make music that sounded like it came straight from heaven. Mozart and Beethoven wrote music for it, and it was even played at a royal Italian wedding. But as popular as warmer stoves and glass harmonicas were, they aren't anywhere near as celebrated nowadays as the invention Ben made after he stole the lightning. Another hint about Ben's most famous invention is that it helped make life easier for everyone. His scientific ideas were helpful too, and were often way ahead of their time. For example, he had a lot of ideas about health. He said that exercise and weightlifting helped keep folks fit, but they have to work hard enough to sweat if they want to do any good. He wrote that breathing fresh air and drinking lots of water are good for you. He was the guy who said, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And before anyone had ever heard of vitamin C, he wrote that oranges, limes, and grapefruit give people healthy gums and skin. Sailors soon got wind of this idea. 
They began eating so many limes to stop getting sick from scurvy at sea that they became known as limeys. Didn't the man ever stop to rest? Even when he was outside, Ben kept right on experimenting. For instance, he often sailed to England and France to do business for America. As he crossed the Atlantic Ocean, he charted the Gulf Stream by taking its temperature. Once sailors knew the route of this fast, warm river in the cold ocean, they could travel between America and Europe in a shorter time than ever before. He was probably the first person to write weather forecasts, too. Once he chased a roaring whirlwind by riding over the hills and forests of Maryland just to find out how it worked. Ben had an old scientific trick that he liked to show people every chance he got. He used to store some oil inside a bamboo walking stick, and whenever he poured a few drops onto angry waves in a pond or lake, the water became smooth as glass. Meanwhile, over in Europe, people called electricians had started doing some tricks of their own. One trick was to raise a boy up near the ceiling with a bunch of silk cords, rub his feet with a glass electric tube, and make sparks shoot out of his hands and face. Another mean trick made the King of France laugh so hard he could hardly stop. His court electrician had run an electric charge through 180 soldiers of the guard, and they jerked to attention faster than they ever had in their entire lives. But although people were doing lots of tricks with electricity, nobody had a clue about why or how it worked. So Benjamin Franklin decided to find out. He asked a British friend to send him an electric tube so that he could do some experiments. In one experiment, he made a cork electric spider with thread for legs. It kept leaping back and forth between a wire and an electric tube, just like it was alive. Another time, he asked a lady and a gentleman to stand on some wax. One held an electric tube, the other held a wire, and when they tried to kiss, they got shocked by all the sparks shooting between their lips. Ben even figured out how to light up a picture of a king in a golden frame. Anyone trying to remove the king's gold paper crown was in for a shock. Doing all these tricks gave Ben his idea for stealing lightning out of the sky. You see, Ben did not agree that being struck by lightning was a punishment for evil deeds. He believed that lightning was nothing more nor less than pure electricity. Now he set out to prove it. First he made a silk kite with a wire on top to attract some lightning. Next he added a kite string, tied a key to the bottom, and knotted a silk ribbon below the key. Ben and his son William stood out of the rain inside the doorway of a shed on the side of a field. To keep from getting shocked, Ben held onto the dry silk ribbon. Then he flew his kite straight up toward the big rain cloud. For the longest time, nothing happened. Just as Ben and William were about to give up, the hair on that wet kite string began to rise up and stand at attention. Ben put his knuckle near the key, and yikes! Out jumped a bright spark of genuine electricity. Real lightning had traveled all the way down that kite string. Ben had stolen electric fire out of the heavens and proven that he was right. Of course, now we know that if the storm had been any stronger, the great inventor would have been toast. Finally, here's the part of the story where Ben's practice from thinking up all those inventions came in so handy. Way back then, you remember, lightning was always setting fire to ships, houses, and church spires. Even the best fire departments couldn't keep entire towns from going up in smoke. So Ben decided to make his most famous invention of all, the lightning rod. The whole idea was to pull lightning safely out of the sky before it could do any mischief. Ben showed people how to put a pointed iron rod on the tip top of a roof or ship's mast and connect it to a wire leading all the way down under the ground or into water. Now the lightning could follow a safe path without burning up a thing. This simple but brilliant invention worked beautifully. It saved more lives than anyone can count and made Ben Franklin a great hero. 
scientists from around the world lined up to give Ben medals and awards. But during his long life, he became much more than the master of lightning. Why, when America fought against Great Britain for the right to become a free nation, Ben convinced France to come help win the war. And when it was over, he helped convince Great Britain to sign the peace. He had helped in so many ways that the people of France honored him with a beautiful medallion. It says, he snatched the lightning from heaven and the scepter from tyrants. And he did. You've probably heard of the great inventor, Benjamin Franklin, and his famous and sometimes mischievous experiments. His most famous and dangerous experiment was flying a kite during a thunderstorm to capture lightning out of the sky. That is one experiment you should not try at home. But he put that knowledge to good use, creating an invention that made everyone's lives better, the lightning rod. To understand more about the lightning rod, let's build a simple electrometer. To start off, we'll need two pieces of thin metallic foil cut to exactly the same size and hole punched at the top. Mylar works especially well for this project. Mylar can be found in foil balloons, tinsel, or what I'm using, confetti. Mylar is used for these products because it's lightweight and very reflective, but it also conducts electricity. Your mylar strips will need to be smooth without wrinkles and trimmed to exactly the same size for this to work. Next, you'll need a paper clip. Bend about half of the tall loop of the paper clip down to create a T shape. Next, take your hole punched mylar strips and slide them onto the loop. Make sure that they can hang and move freely. Push the top of the paper clip through the lid of a plastic to go cup. The lid should hold the paper clip in place while the mylar strips hang down freely. If one strip hangs down lower than the other, give it one final trim to make sure they are perfectly even. When it's ready, insert the whole thing into a plastic to go cup and close the lid. Now you've made your own electrometer. An electrometer is a device for measuring electricity. So to use it, we'll need to charge up some static electricity. Rub a balloon against your hair, clothing, or a stuffed animal. If you've ever done this experiment before, you'll know what's about to happen. My hair is going to get very staticky and frizzy and stick to the balloon the things we do for science. So what's happening that causes this effect? Remember, all matter is made up of tiny particles called atoms. Atoms have a middle part called a nucleus that has a positive charge, and the atom is orbited by electrons that contain a negative charge. The positive and negative charges attract each other and so the electrons orbit round and round the atoms. But sometimes they can break away. When I rub the balloon against my hair, the friction causes some of the electrons in my hair to break away and become attached to the balloon. So the balloon itself now has a negative charge. And my hair has lost so many electrons that it has a positive charge. Positive and negative charges attract, and so, my hair wants to stick to the balloon. When the balloon is charged up with negative electrons, with nowhere for them to go, this is called static, or non-moving electricity. But electrons don't like to stay static. They want somewhere to go. That's where our electrometer comes in. The mylar strips and the paper clip are both good conductors of electricity. So, when the balloon gets close enough, the electrons jump onto the paper clip and onto the mylar strips. The electrons spread out across the mylar strips. There's nowhere else for them to go. Now the mylar strips themselves are negatively charged because they are full of negatively charged electrons. When they have received enough negative electrons, they will spread apart from each other. 
because negative charges repel other negative charges. Given enough time, the electrons that have collected on the mylar sheets will distribute back into the atmosphere, and the sheets will come back together. But you can also discharge them all at once. Simply take the electrometer outside and set it on the ground. You should see the mylar strips drop back into place. This is called grounding. You've given the electricity a new path to follow. The electrons jump from the mylar strips to the ground. If it's not working and the mylar strips don't snap back together, try turning the cup upside down and touching the paper clip to the ground. This is a more direct path for the electrons to follow. This is just like how Benjamin Franklin's lightning rod works. Did you know lightning is also made of static electricity? When the water in a cloud freezes and the particles crash into each other, this produces an electric charge, just like the balloon rubbing against my hair. All this negatively charged static electricity is trapped inside the cloud, but it doesn't want to stay there. When enough charge builds up, it jumps to the ground, producing lightning. The lightning will take the shortest path to the ground, whether that's through a tree, or a telephone pole, or someone's house. Benjamin Franklin noticed this and gave the lightning an alternative, a faster way to the ground, in the form of the lightning rod. The lightning rod was probably the most important of all of Benjamin Franklin's inventions. It saved thousands of lives and homes. And it's still used in buildings today in the form of a grounding wire. There's one in your own home. For more information about receiving STEAM kits, visit the Kids and Families page at coosbaylibrary.org.